Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fifth of this series of Return to Work. Each week, the U.S. Chamber Foundation has been pulling together leaders from government and academia and business and nonprofits, all to help the business community understand how we can return to work safely and responsibly. We started the series with a Harvard epidemiologist for kind of a large 30,000 foot look. We've also taken in-depth looks into the critical areas of testing, child care and workplace safety. Today, we're delighted to turn our attention to transportation. We're going to focus on this important topic because we know that moving both people and commerce through transportation networks and transit systems is crucial to getting our economy moving again. For the most part, these networks have remained operational throughout the crisis, although in some cases at a reduced capacity. But when business returns to even a semi-normal pace, there's going to be a host of new challenges and complexities. For instance, how will social distancing work for rush hour commuters? Packed subway trains and buses will obviously be out of the question for the foreseeable future. Today, we're going to look at this topic of transportation of people and commerce from a bunch of different viewpoints, from the viewpoint of a company whose business model is wholly reliant on a well-functioning transportation system, from the viewpoint of an infrastructure hub through which commerce and economic activity flows, and from the viewpoints of public transit systems that safely carry millions of passengers to work every day. For today's discussion, we're delighted to welcome Raj Subramanian, the President and Chief Operating Officer for FedEx Corp. Raj oversees almost 500,000 team members. His international leadership experience, keen business insights, and forward-looking focus are key drivers of FedEx's success. Also joining us is Rick Cotton, Executive Director of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. The Port Authority's network of aviation, ground, rail, and seaport facilities is among the busiest in the country, supporting more than 500,000 jobs and generating $80 billion in economic activity annually. We're also very pleased to have with us Noria Fernandez, General Manager and CEO of the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority and Chair of the American Public Transportation Association. At the Santa Clara VTA, she, VTA, excuse me, she oversees more than 2,000 employees, leads mobility solutions for more than 2 million people who live and work in Silicon Valley. Finally, we're glad to be joined by Phil Washington, CEO of the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. As leader, as the leader of LA's Metro, he manages a budget in excess of $7 billion and 11,000 employees. Before the crisis, LA Metro transported over 1 million passengers daily on a fleet of buses and six rail lines. We're looking forward to each of these perspectives on transportation in the time of coronavirus. Reminder that we do take audience questions throughout, so please use the chat feature if there's something that you'd like to address to a speaker. So let's turn first to Raj. Thank you so much for being with us today. Before we get into the conversation about returning to work, I want to ask you about some of the important ways that FedEx has been leading during this critical phase of this crisis. Tell us a little bit about Project Airbridge. And thank you, Suzanne, and it's great to be here and appreciate your inviting me for this conversation. Uh, we, you know, find ourselves uh, during the last few months and weeks really in the front lines of this crisis. So the first thing I have to say is that our nearly 500,000 folks around the world are just simply going above and beyond the call of duty and uh, in, in, you know, really you know, taking care of our customers and really moving critical shipments. So we've been working with HHS and in a project Airbridge. As you all know, I mean, you know, moving PPEs is becoming very critical these days. And, you know, there's a huge demand supply imbalance and the, you know, a lot of the demand is coming out of China. And, uh, you know, we are one of the few operators who continue to operate uh, out of China. We fly roughly 250 flights a week on a regularly scheduled basis but you know we have now flying you know almost 100 flights and ex extra on top of that this month and uh, it's, it's it's essentially carrying healthcare related material uh, to the United States and to Europe 
And so with Project Airbridge, we're working uh, with, with HHS to move personal protective equipment uh, for, uh, to the United States and distributing it to uh, various parts uh, right here. So that's just one of the things we've done, uh, but it's something that, uh, you know, we, you know, we continue to provide that link from, uh, especially from China uh, to the United States. I think it's such an important question, the, all of these global supply chains and the trade routes and something we're certainly going to be dealing with uh, long after this phase of this crisis is over. But turning to our domestic issues for a moment, could you tell us a little bit about the latest on FedEx's role in handling testing swabs from the federal community-based sites and also the drive-up testing centers? Yeah, no, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, so within the U.S., you know, that's from the very get go uh, when it was announced that there were going to be, that testing is going to happen at, at the parking lots of uh, several different, you know, uh, retailers. Uh, then we were immediately engaged in moving uh, those test kits uh, from those parking lots and other facilities to the labs. So, you know, uh, from the very, you know, very beginning of this, we have been moving, you know, multiple, almost a million test kits uh, from, uh, from these parking lots, you know, consolidating them and moving into the, in the labs for testing. So that, that's, uh, that's been ongoing. And well, as new tests have evolved, like Abbott and so on and so forth, we are also now moving those tests, you know, to different parts where it's required. So anytime that you see an announcement regarding whether the, whether the test of vaccine, you can rest assured that FedEx has had some role to play in that because we are in the process of moving those to the places needed. It's fascinating because you started with talking about moving PPE from China, then you're talking about the important role your company's playing in domestic testing, and yet a lot of consumers see you every day too, playing an important role on their doorsteps. You know, and one of the questions that we get sometimes is, should your customers worry about a package that shows up on their doorstep? How safe is it? Yeah, so let me uh, address that right away. We have heard from the authorities, whether it's WHO or CDC, that the risk of such a, such a uh, virus being transmitted to such a, such a way is very remote. And uh, we have heard no situation of that. We have moved millions of packages now, but you do raise a very important point here uh, about, you know, delivering packages within e commerce. And, um, you know, as people are staying at home and shelter at home and ordering more things at home, we are, we are seeing an explosion in volume that's being delivered to your doorstep. So hopefully you're seeing your FedEx driver, as you and I were talking, as everyone is seeing their FedEx driver more often these days. <laughs> I know they're becoming our best friends and our only company. Uh, so we talked about all of the different ways that you're operating during this crisis. So clearly you are not a company that has been able to shut down or, or had to shut down or pause in any way. So talk to us a little bit about how you're ensuring your employees and your customers safety, because as you know, we're trying to gather those best practices for other business leaders to learn from. So once again, I have to, you know, recognize our frontline heroes of FedEx. Again, we find ourselves in the front lines of this pandemic, and I, it's just it's just been incredible. And as as we have, uh, you know, executed our uh, our mission of, you know, delivering goods across the across the world. Now we saw this started happen way back in January in China, and uh, so we saw it go across the world to Europe, and then of course finally. In the United States, and we, you know, we have developed a plan of operation um, uh, to, you know, you know, make sure that, you know, this to get the PPEs to our frontline folks. We have now temperature screening in several facilities, no contact temperature screening uh, in in big facilities for, for that we have deployed. Uh, we're making sure that at the point of delivery, it's contactless, so that you know there's no signature required on the part of the customer to do anything. Um, and, you know, temp, uh, and the, you know, making sure that if anybody's, you know, not feeling well, then, you know, we obviously uh, then we send them back. And then even in an office setting, of course, you know, working from home as all of us are now uh, taking on a whole new meaning. 
So again, we put safety first, and uh, and uh, we're making you know ever doing everything possible uh, to make sure that our employees are served well as we deliver a very very essential commodity and duty and service to to the world. What has your approach been? Talk more about employee testing. Yeah, so we have um, test. You know, as test kits have become more available, we are we are making you know making sure that we have the opportunity uh, to get those tests done. I think that's one big example I can show you, talk with you, is about our pilots, and uh, especially as they operate. And so we have gone above and beyond and actually getting some of those Abbott kits and uh, just so that we can get quick results. Uh, and you know, and so that you know, we we put them, uh, you know, we, as we deploy them in all parts of the world, uh, that you know, we we ensure that they are you know tested negative before they get on an airplane, and it's it's a it's a it's a big deal because the you know you know the the situation if they are get you know get to a, some other country and then they get tested positive there, then the situation becomes very difficult. So we're doing everything in our power to avoid that. And uh, so that, you know, there's a lot, lots here uh, and uh, it's very complex operation as you can imagine. And uh, again, we're doing everything we can. Well, I know what a premium you put on safety. Uh, you talked a minute ago about some of the changes that you have put in place to ensure kind of contactless delivery, et cetera. Do you imagine that some of those changes stick post this pandemic? Does either some part of your business operation and or consumer expectation change? Yeah, no, I think this is very important as, you know, as someone much wiser than me said, you know, you have to fight the war in front of us right now, but you also have to win the peace that's coming afterwards. So you got to plan for that. So you have to think right now to say, lay down some markers as I said, where do you think it's going to be when this is kind of behind us. We are not going back to where we were before the whole thing started. So what are those, some of those markers? For example, you know, uh, e-commerce was represented roughly 15% of commerce uh, prior to the crisis. You know, we and we have seen, as I said before, everyone at home ordering everything from home these days. So do we, what level do we go back to mm -hmm post this crisis. I mean, I think we, we, you know, I think it is not going to go back to 15. It's going to go back to some other level. So that changes the dynamic of how we operate. Um, you know, what does work from home look like? What does the future of international trade look like? I mean, so these are some big questions that, you know, we have to start to begin to plan here. You asked a specific question around contactless delivery. That's, you know, we'll, we'll make that determination as we as we get come back around, but there are many such questions that we will be asking and answering uh, and but try to skate to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck was. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it's really interesting watching the great strategy minds like yours and other people at FedEx and some of our other big members be able to be so agile in this moment, but then also try to predict where that puck is going after this. At the chamber, we've talked a bit about how there's the phase of the public health emergency, which is of course the first priority, and the phase of the economic emergency. Now we've kind of moved into this, okay, what can we learn? How do we prepare for the next phase? How, what's the gradual reopening look like? We really interesting to get to the next phase, which will be the learning from all of this, both yeah. what can medical, and scientists learn about, you know, why weren't children transmitting it? Does that mean schools could reopen faster? Uh, but also from the business leader standpoint, what what all of you learned from it? You know, some people are saying, you know, as you know, FedEx and the chamber have worked really closely together for years on the need for infrastructure improvement in the United States. And some people are suggesting, well, we've got fewer people on the road right now, fewer commuters. Uh, people who certainly need jobs. Maybe this is the time for uh, the big upgrade and the modernization that we know we need in that system. So what do you think? Is this the time for a Federal Infrastructure Modernization Act? Uh, we couldn't agree more with the need for improvement of infrastructure. And I think um, you're going to see uh, the, the more we put in, or especially on the road infrastructure around the country, 
the more efficient uh, we can get as a country and as an economy, and especially as the trends that we just talked about uh, start to unfold. So, you know, we would be fully supportive of any anything in, in this direction uh, to repair our roads and bridges and making sure that they are in good shape to make move to move on twin 33 foot trailers. There's, there's a technical issue here, but you know, these are safe. There are larger units of capacity and uh, I think more efficient and environmentally more friendly. So th there are several things that can happen uh, that I think will be very beneficial to where the economy is headed in the future. Uh, let me ask you one last question. I'm getting texts about this, and it's it's uh, I think it's a compliment to you and to your your team there. But some of the smaller businesses who are who are watching you today and who are customers of FedEx are assuming that you have uh, maybe a different level of insight than they do, or talk to more economists than they do, and are curious about you know what you think this recovery looks looks like, and can they be optimistic about their businesses coming back fast? Yeah, so firstly, let me uh, thank our small, medium customers. They're really the lifeblood of FedEx, and we do stand for small. And I think that's uh, it's, it's really that's the power of our connection. As the, the reason we exist is really to connect customers, um, uh, these small and medium businesses, with their customers around the world. And that's the power uh, that you know ultimately it's a win-win proposition. In terms of scenarios, I think uh, people are looking for precision in this time is are going to be, uh, you know, disappointed because it's very difficult to give you precision. However, we have to look at scenarios. We have created three scenarios. One is what we call a May barbecue scenario where we, we you know, will come out of this situation faster. The next one is the dog days of summer and the third one is after the vaccine. So. We have to prepare for these scenarios. I'm not saying one is going more likely than the other. We don't know yet, and um, but we do expect that the you know post a certain period here that the economy will come back. People will want to trade and travel. It's after all, human beings are wired that way, and uh, it's only a the question is going to be how soon and how quick uh, will the recovery be. And so from our point of view, we are preparing for all the scenarios and making some moves, uh, thinking where it's going to come. I, I remain optimistic um, that the next year, 2021, uh, that the demand uh, will, be, uh, will be back and uh, we'll have to fight through the next two, three, four months. Uh, I love that. We're going to let you end on that optimistic note to your small and medium sized customers. But I really want to thank you for being with us, but also for everything that you're doing right now in terms of bringing equipment from China, in terms of getting testing swabs where they need to be, in terms of helping uh, small business and customers at home keep going with e-commerce and things they need. Uh, it's a real service and uh, we're lucky to have you with us on the program and keep up the great work because we need you. Thank you, Suzanne. I think within FedEx, we say this is who we are and this is what we do, and we're just proud to play a part. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Turning now to Rick Cotton, who's the executive director of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Rick, thank you for being here. Pleasure to be with you, Suzanne. Now, I understand that you were among, you personally were, were among one of the first diagnosed cases of COVID-19 in New York City. So how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, there was a period where uh, both myself and my wife uh, tested positive. I had a relatively mild case. She had a tougher road. We were both quarantined for 14 days, but we both tested negative uh, and we are feeling quite well and back at work. Thank you for asking. Well, I'm glad to hear all of that, and I can't imagine that you went through that without it impacting how you're thinking about your day job. And so how has it informed your work? Well, it certainly brought home uh, the uh, the dangers, the challenge of uh, people who do test positive who come down with this disease. It is so it is so variable that one of the elements uh, is frankly the anxiety because you don't know what course the disease is going to is going to take. So it has uh, really uh, made me extremely empathetic and concerned that we focus on the safety of of employees. 
And the second aspect uh, which it really brought home, I the day before I tested positive, uh, I had been in the office and I met uh, in various meetings with 32 different uh, individuals. Uh, and every single one of those, because they had been in contact me, was quarantined for as protective, a protective quarantine for 14 days. So in terms of operating the agency, it became very clear very quickly that operating procedures had to change dramatically, in, not only in terms of the safety of employees, but to work in a way that if an employee did test positive, we wound up with the minimum number of employees in protective quarantine. So we tried to move as quickly as we could, both to put safety precautions in, in terms of protecting the health of employees, but also working uh, in different teams, having staggered hours, uh, obviously moving very, very quickly to uh, having employees who could work remotely, work remotely, but really transform the way we did business. So we both protected health, but we also protected the workplace in terms of trying to minimize the number of employees who would have to go into quarantine as a result of a positive test. You know, that's the most compelling argument I've heard for a staggered return. And we were talking to a business owner the other day who was saying, when you think about staggered, you don't want to do it by division or department because then you could lose the whole division or department at one time if they have to self-quarantine. So you really want to think about spreading out your staggered hours. I mean, it's, it's, it's so complex to think about. But let me turn to your business a little bit. So the Port Authority has traditionally operated a financially self-sustaining model. Um, but reports that I'm reading here, these estimates are that air and rail passengers in your area have declined by as much as 95% and road traffic through tolls is down 60%. So I can't imagine that that isn't a devastating financial or operational impact due to all that lost revenue. And so how do you adjust so that you can continue to provide what's really an essential service? Well, one thing we have made an absolute commitment to the region is that we'll, we will keep every single one of our facilities open and operating, and we are doing that. The challenge, as you say, is uh, on, on multiple fronts. Our airport volume is literally down more than 95%. The commuter railroad that we operate is down uh, in terms of passenger volume by 95%. The Toll facilities, bridges and tunnels that we operate down, as you said, by almost two thirds. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the seaport uh, is not down as much, and I'd say a little bit more about that in a minute. But the consequence of those uh, volume drops is to have an extremely negative impact on financials. We are dependent in large measure on revenue that is activity dependent. And so as we look at that, uh, at that impact, one thing we have done is to shrink what I call the operating footprint. So we've worked with the airlines at the airports where we consolidate uh, flights into particular gates and particular concourses to reduce the amount of maintenance, security, cleaning that has to be done at the facilities. We've reduced the uh, operating schedule on our commuter railroad, but we've had two goals absolutely in mind, which is given the drop in volume, it may, does not make sense to continue operating at the same frequency, but we're absolutely committed to provide reliable service so that essential workers can get to and from work. And secondly, we're committed to providing a service which enables riders who do have to travel to maintain social distance. And we monitor every literally every train to assure that is the case. At our bridges and tunnels, we uh, remove toll collectors, so there's no longer cash collection. It is entirely electronic. And then we have put in, in terms of operating procedures, uh, as many safety checks as we possibly can. So the financial impact, however, is indeed severe in what I might call normal times, our revenues significantly out, um, are higher than our expenses. Uh, as you say, we are self-sustaining. We get no funding from uh, either the state of New York and New Jersey. That's the way the Port Authority was set up nearly 100 years ago. But what 
what we do with that excess of revenue over expenses develop is devote every dime of it to supporting our capital plan. So what is impacted by this dramatic reduction in revenue is questions about what happens to our capital plan. And that is what we are looking at very, very intensely. And we are at risk of significant cuts if we don't get federal funding. It's a it's a remarkable time, particularly because I imagine, like you said about your own office, that your network of essential workers has been hard hit by this. And so it just again, you know, it points to the complexity of trying to run an even an essential service at this time. Let me well, I would I would like to pay tribute to the employees of the Port Authority in terms of their dedication and commitment. And we have, by virtue of moving quickly in terms of uh, putting people on staggered shifts, having what we call A and B teams. So if you have a critical skill, you, div you divide that uh, set of employees with that skill into two teams and try to be sure they are uh, either working staggered shifts or even staggered days. So we have been able uh, to reduce what was initially uh, having 700, uh, 750 employees quarantined down to less than 350. So we are seeing significant impacts from working differently. As you start to think about New York reopening and kind of getting back to a new normal uh, or a semi-normal, what do you think that looks like for the Port Authority, both for your employees, but also for the public? Well, um, those policies are going to be set by uh, the governor of New York and the governor of New Jersey. So we are um, we are looking to the two states for guidance in terms of what reopening looks like. We recognize, and indeed, uh, Governor Cuomo this morning was uh, and over the weekend has said that the first two sectors in New York that will reopen are the construction sector and the manufacturing sector. And that as uh, sectors do reopen in phases, that then the state will wait two weeks to see what the experience is in terms of testing, monitoring, in, uh, reinfect or infection rates, and just be sure that the opening is not causing a rekindling of the spread of the of the virus. So I think you can extrapolate from that that it is going to be gradual. It is going to be sector by sector. It will com be combined with major testing and tracing programs and that we will need to meter the uh, opening of the transportation facilities that we run consistent with that gradual reopening. But we uh, will be in dialogue with the state because, uh, as you point out, crowded trains uh, and crowded facilities. We also run the bus terminal in New York City, which is the busiest in the nation. And we are going to have to look at what the capacity of these facilities are in order to avoid crowded conditions. Uh, and another maybe reason that they'll have to be staggered hours and staggered you know, workforces. It, going back a minute, you talked about bridging New York and New Jersey, and, and a question we get from a lot of business owners is about conflicting guidelines or having to deal with more than one set of rules. And so how are you finding the communication and collaboration between the two states? Well, it's very good. Uh, we're, uh, since we are a bi-state agency, day-to-day, uh, -day, even before the crisis, we are used to working with, with both states. Uh, the fact is that the governors in the tri-state area have uh, coordinated their uh, their policy making. It's now expanded to six states. So we are in constant contact in terms of understanding what the guidelines are and uh, the, the, the policy directives from the two states have been very well coordinated. If you could, you know, look into the camera and talk directly to the users of your services, which you probably are live with some of them. What is your hope in terms of how they will think about returning to work in a way that will 
ease the demand or, or make it easier for you to provide that service? What would you say straight to those customers? Well, what I would say straight to the customers is that uh, over the last two or two and a half years, we have made customer experience just a, a priority of the Port Authority. We have become very customer centric and we have said to ourselves that we have to earn the trust and confidence of our customers that we are going to operate in new and different ways that will absolutely go the last mile in protecting everyone's safety. So we are thinking that through. We are thinking not only of the operating changes we have to make, but of the communication changes, of the social distancing that has to be built into how we operate these facilities, the cleaning, uh, every aspect of how we assure people that the facilities, the airports, the commuter railroad, the bus terminal will evaluate very, very carefully what we can do to assure people that they uh, can have confidence in safely using the facilities. Well, you certainly project that confidence and given your own experience, empathy. So the Port Authority looks like it's in great hands for, from where I sit. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Absolutely. We're going to turn now to Noria Fernandez, who is the CEO of the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority and also the chair of the American Public Transportation Association. And so Noria, first, thank you so much for being with us. And second, how has the coronavirus impacted the nation's mass transit providers? Uh, thank you so much for having us here today, Suzanne, and I look forward to this conversation. I have to say that in my almost 35 years um, in public transit, I have never experienced uh, anything like we're experiencing today as a result of this coronavirus. So I want to just take a quick opportunity to express uh, my heartfelt condolences to the transit systems that have lost uh, members of their team to the, to the virus and also to all of those in our nation who are experiencing hardship. So, you know, there's an old saying in the military that no plan survives the first encounter with the enemy. So there you have it. Uh, we in, uh, at the Valley Transportation Authority last year had been developing a plan that we put in place this past December because similar to the other transit agencies in the nation, we have been experiencing a decline in our ridership uh, for the past several years a decline that uh, required us to rethink and reset how we were providing service. So we did that and just uh, this past December 28. Uh, so interestingly enough, as we were monitoring um, how that changed, which focused primarily in some of our busiest routes, where we added additional uh, frequency to our service, we were, we were uh, monitoring that and, and then this happened, the pandemic happened. Uh, so at the Valley Transportation Authority, uh, we took all of the necessary steps. You may know that the Santa Clara County, where we're located, was the first county in the nation to declare a sheltering place uh, on March 16th. And we sh immediately after that uh, provided all of the, um, the protective, uh, personal protective equipment that we had on hand to our first uh, frontline workers, our operators and our maintenance personnel. Uh, it's over the course of time, of course, that we've been able to build that stock, but uh, we, we took that action um, and uh, shortly thereafter, we implemented a series of uh, initiatives to ensure that the riding public um, was uh, protected in, in addition to our operators. Well, the shelter in place required us to also introduce the six foot social distancing. And when you think about public transit, you don't really think about social distancing. It is a mode of transportation that's built in moving masses of people. And that is the benefit of it, that we can move a lot of people with, with a single uh, vehicle. Uh, so that required a whole different way of how we were gonna approach uh, mobility. What has helped significantly is the fact that uh, with the shelter in place, only essential workers or those who were seeking essential services should be traveling. And we developed a, a 
program to reach to all of our riders and emphasize the nature of the essential service so that we could provide, uh, continue providing service because just like our customers, our operators and other personnel um, were either became uh, concerned because they had to take care of family members or had um, pre-existing -condi pre conditions and many of the other uh, elements that affected many of those who could not go to work if they were uh, an essential uh, service provider. So therefore, we had to adjust. We had to adjust our service. We had to adjust the way that uh, individuals use our service. And as a uh, industry, we have had to do what our industry does very well. We know how to plan, but we also know how to be flexible and how to be able to continue de delivering what is clearly a lifeline to our community. Uh, that is our buses, our trains, uh, in some areas there are ferries that are also providing that connection and uh, shuttle, and taking care of the senior, the elderly, and those who depend on our paratransit service uh, for access to uh, not only uh, to get tested in some instances, but to continue receiving that medical care, whether it's dialysis or any other care that uh, they had um, have scheduled and that they that they require. Uh, Dorian, let's, yes. let's let me jump for a second um, because that was a, that's a lot to digest. So let me try to break that down for just a second into three different topics. Um, one thing I heard you talk about was a kind of reduced demand if only the essential workers and businesses were technically allowed to be riders or users of systems in this moment. So picking up on that for a minute, and then I want to pick up on another thing you said, picking up on that for a minute, what happens now as you start to think about different cities and states reopening and that demand coming back? Um, how do you still meet these social distance guidelines as you start to get full demand back? Uh, that's a very important question and uh, one that um, I want to make two points up, uh, in my response. The first one is that not only has the environment change, uh, but the businesses are going to change the way that they operate as well as those of us who are providing access to uh, businesses, we have to think differently. And I, I want to assure you that um, speaking not only as the uh, head of the Valley Transportation Authority, but the chair of APTA, that we are very cognizant of the fact that there needs to be a recovery uh, that we should be planning. And then what we look like at the other side of this pandemic. On the APTA front, uh, I have established a APTA Mobility Recovery and Restoration Task Force, and Phil Washington is going to uh, chair that, and he'll be talking after me. But at the local level, what we're doing is also developing a recovery plan, and one that starts to look at what the impact of social distancing is going to have on our existing asset, our existing fleet, uh, if we're going to be required to provide more service so that we can ensure that we do not, we, we only keep the maximum number of passengers on our system that is socially acceptable and also for the protection not only of those riders but also of our operators, then that's going to require more service. Uh, the challenge, of course, that we are experiencing is that for many of us, the revenues that we use to operate our service is not just from the fare box. Uh, in my case, at here in Santa Clara County, 80% uh, of our budget is based on sales tax. And sales tax, as you know, are a result of the, are also being affected by what's happening globally and with our national economy. So if those sales tax revenues are going to come in at half of what we anticipate, then we have this challenge. We're very grateful to the federal uh, government for the CARES Act, which provided us with an infusion of funding, but that's not going to be sufficient. Uh, that may carry us through the summer and fall. Uh, so we, we really need to start thinking about what is the level of service, how we serve the customers, and then how we tie into business, and then better understand, especially here in Silicon Valley, 
how are those businesses planning to operate? Are they going to do what they've always done? Are they going to be looking at uh, a combination of telecommuting uh, or, or straggle um, uh, attendance uh, at, their, at their workplaces? It's a whole host of things, and it's not a solution that we can come up with insularly. We have to work with the community. We have to work with our counties, our cities, and the business community to try to figure out how we can identify uh, we can take advantage of this lull uh, in operations to to craft the best plan that can better serve the Santa Clara County and the region. Thank you for that. Let me go ahead and bring Phil in. Phil Washington is the CEO of the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Phil, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Suzanne. It's good to be with you. Well, I appreciate it. And, and you know, in, in trying to pick up some of the threads from what Noria was saying, um, and maybe I'm getting some of them wrong, but I, I was hearing, or at least I was becoming a little pessimistic, because if you think about uh, reduced revenue at a time when you could have increased demand, at a time when you need uh, you know, to put fewer people on a bus or on a metro, it all it all sounds it all starts to sound very complex to plan for. So, let me ask you to speak directly to the employers attending today. Should they be worried about getting back to work that their people won't be able to get there? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Um, I see this uh, and the recovery that comes later as an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to uh, almost reinvent transit through this crisis. Uh, I talk a lot about, uh, you know, what would we do if we had the opportunity to create a whole new city? And in some respects, we have that opportunity uh, to rethink what we have done, to rethink what the new normal looks like, um, I think um, what this crisis has done, as bad as it is, um, it has reinforced the importance of transit in many, many ways. Um, we have essential workers. Um, I was talking to a group just last week and I was talking about how transit uh, has become the foundation to move those essential workers. Uh, we are still carrying about 400,000 people a day. Wow. Uh, that is incredible. Now, that's down from our 1.2 million a day, uh, but to still be carrying uh, that many people a day. And so there are things that we, not just us here in Los Angeles, but uh, heard Rick Cotton talking and uh, others uh, in the industry, um, what we have, some of the things and the new approaches that we have taken to transit, uh, even in the interim, can become permanent. Uh, when we see uh, how people, the, you know, less congestion, I look out my window and the 101 here in Los Angeles, people are going 75 miles an hour. It's incredible. <laughs> uh, uh, but we can make that the new normal. Uh, when you think about people, I was reading an article about, uh, you know, a guy uh, was talking about he uh, can see the Himalayas for the first time in his life. Uh, that's because air quality uh, has become so much better. So I believe uh, for the employers out there, we will come back uh, bigger and stronger, and we are preparing for that. Uh, okay, so a couple of questions are coming in from the audience, and I'm going to ask you. This is two different, two two questions in one, but I know I know I, I know you can handle it. Um, from your position in thinking about um, LA or or generally transit systems across the United States, what is your responsibility, and how can you help with this crisis? I'm thinking of things like. Uh, cleaning and sanitation, uh, sanitization, things that give confidence to riders. And what can the riders do to give confidence to your employees? And I'm thinking there about masks and social distancing. And so what are some of the responsibilities on both sides of this equation? Well, I mean, we must regain the people's confidence in transit. There's no doubt about that. People now have a higher expectation of transit uh, from here on out, they will. 
uh, people will be thinking about sanitizing. They'll be thinking about social distancing forever now. Um, they will expect these protocols to continue and we will continue them. Uh, so the question, you know, how do we make sure our riders are confident to ride public transportation? I was talking to a friend of mine, Paul Wiedefeld, who runs uh, Washington uh, Metro. He used to also run uh, B BWI Airport. And he talked about after 9-11, the airline industry uh, had to work really hard to win back the confidence of customers. And it really came down to safety uh, at that time and restoring confidence. On transit, I believe it's going to come down to cleanliness. Uh, it's going to come down to hygiene. So we have to convince people that we're doing everything we need uh, to do in order to keep them safe and healthy on the system. And one way to do that is by painting this picture with data to make riders feel safe. Uh, and, um, you know, and it's not just transit that have to win back this public confidence. It's sports stadiums, it's concert venues, it's movie theaters, it's Broadway shows. We all have a similar, a similar challenge uh, to approach this. And so we're thinking about that and we're also uh, looking to educate our riders, uh, educate them that they have a role in making sure that they exercise hygiene, uh, highly recommending masks um, um, uh, as we go forward. So I think one, it's an opportunity. Two, we have to uh, regain the people's confidence in transit. And I think we can do all those things. Uh Gosh, I want to ask so many questions, but I'm getting one from the audience, so let me ask theirs. Um, what impacts have you seen with decreased ridership and tax receipts, with so many people teleworking, et cetera? Do you anticipate a long-term financial impact, or do you hope to recoup revenues when we all get back to work later this summer? Well, just a little bit about revenues. Uh, you know, that revenue, I mean, and we are heavily dependent on sales tax revenue, and that means people going out and buying stuff. Um, that revenue is lost. I mean, we have, uh, we're looking at a sales tax revenue hole of about $800 million. Uh, we are, as you know, the largest county in America of 10 million people in one county. Uh, and so we realize that uh, that revenue uh, is really lost. Um, and so we are having to think of ways that we can um, defer things. I mean, what things are essential, what things are non-essential, uh, what things uh, can we do without for the time being? Now, I do believe that uh, this economy is going to come back. And so the question in my mind is how can transit assist in the upcoming recovery? Uh, there are people that have lost their jobs. Uh, there are people uh, that will have a hard road, um, you know, when we open things back up. Uh, and so we're thinking about how we can assist in that recovery. Uh, but also we are calling uh, on Congress right now uh, to uh, approve an infrastructure transportation bill. I mean, what better time than now uh, to uh, approve an infrastructure bill to jumpstart this economy. What better time than now uh, to rebuild America, uh, to do a Marshall Plan uh, with transportation infrastructure? What better time than now to raise the gas tax? Um, if there is uh, any time uh, it's now to jumpstart the economy with job creation and all those things. So I think uh, as bad as this crisis is, we have an opportunity uh, to really recreate uh, transportation infrastructure. Uh, Suzanne, this is Nuria. Can I j just add to that? Of course. Yeah, thank you. I would like to also say that the the focus on how transit comes back and its criticality, how critical it is to the lifeline of the economy, not only affects urban areas, but also rural areas. Uh, at the American Public Transportation Association, we represent transit systems all across the spectrum. 
And I can tell you that there are a larger number of small transit agencies that are serving rural communities and are also trying to figure out what happens to them. They're critical in their response. Uh, they're, they're being used for uh, emergency response to get um, residents to hospitals that may be in a, diff in a different community uh, uh, miles away. So I think that this recovery is not just about the, the urbanized areas, but it's about every corner of America. And that's why it's so important. And as, as Phil mentioned, the additional funding that we are asking, uh, that we've asked uh, Congress to consider in the next package is one that is going to help public transportation stay on its feet because not only have we proven uh, throughout these six weeks of the pandemic that we are essential, uh, but that we are the lifeline of how this economy will recover. Mobility. Let me jump in and ask you. Top. Let me ask you a question. We're getting from our uh, uh, audience here. Uh, someone is saying, as the head of a small urban chamber in Pittsburgh, my members are looking for more information about public transportation as companies return return to work. Are there any resources available about the safety of public transportation? or how we think about transit options. So where should a small chamber, and you're talking about places that aren't super urban, where should they go for more information right now? If they have access uh, to uh, the internet and have access to uh, websites, I would direct them to the American Public Transportation Association, the APTA website at apta.com. We have created a resource page with a lot of FAQs and then also links to uh, guidelines uh, from CDC as it relates to uh, health and welfare of employees uh, and with protocols and cleaning and protective equipment. And then uh, we also partnered with the John Hopkins uh, University um, on a guideline for transit agencies. Uh, there is a, a number of uh, I guess uh, lessons or best practices that different transit systems are are putting in place, and many of them are small operators. So all of that is available on our on the APTA website. Now I I have to say that some of the information is accessible to members only, but there is a lot of good resources that are available to the public at large. Thank you so much, um, Phil. Let me ask you a question that we get a fair amount, which is. How do you inform, I mean, I think that in, in terms of bringing confidence back, people want to believe if they get on a bus, if they get on a metro, that um, you'll have done your part in terms of cleaning, but also that there's some enforcement of social distancing or some enforcement of the use of masks or gloves or whatever it is that public officials determine should be the guidelines. Um, and yet that seems to put yet another burden on you running a transit system. So what do you think about enforcement? I think well, enforcement, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's, let's start with Phil. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so I think a couple of, couple of thoughts. Um, people are incredibly, um, uh, what we've seen anyway, is if people are actually uh, doing some self uh, uh, enforcement, if you will. Uh, you know, I ride the train even now. I ride uh, our bus rapid transit. Uh, right here in Los Angeles to come to come down to the office every day. And um, so there's a fair amount of social distancing uh, by our riders themselves. And so that's one thing. The other thing uh, is we have to be prepared uh, as transit uh, agencies. And I know this is tough for uh, many agencies. It's tough for us as well, but we have to be prepared uh, to put uh, additional resources uh, in service on the street. Uh, and so this is going to take uh, sort of quick strike, what I call quick strike service adjustments based on on street reality. Meaning when we see that a route is crowded, we have to be able uh, to put uh, an extra bus uh, or two or three extra buses on that route. It's going to take that kind of quick strike thinking and quick strike service scheduling uh, to do that on the street. And I think that is just going to be the new normal. Uh, I'd add one other quick thing too, and that is 
what we're seeing now, I believe, as the new normal, uh, is more people telecommuting. Uh, I think we are going to see travel patterns that change. Uh, and this could possibly lead to uh, not even a peak period, the tip of the traditional peak period from let's say seven to nine. There's gonna be a lot of people that say, listen, I'm coming in at 10, 1030 uh, to avoid those crowds. And so we have to adjust uh, our service and I think uh, people around the country will have to adjust their service to this change in travel patterns that I believe is going to occur. The Zooms, the, um, the, the various teleconferencing that we're doing now, I think may be the new norm, which could bold uh, very tough for those uh, commercial office buildings that have all the space uh, downtown. You know, it's really interesting because when you think about in times of great disruption, uh, change that may have been coming gradually frequently comes quite suddenly. And so the question will be both where are the innovators and what innovation happens, but also uh, just what, what comes on us so rapidly that we weren't expecting it. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, I really appreciate Noria and Phil, you both being with us. As we think about a path forward, we think about a return to work, how people get there, the underlying essential services of transportation will be key. It was wonderful to hear from you and also to hear from Rick and Raj about moving commerce and cargo and how important that is. It's a crucial part of our work. I hope that all of you will continue to be with us. You'll contact us at uschamberfoundation.org. Email us at foundation at uschamber.com. We'd like to hear your questions and comments for future programs. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their time today and for helping us get smarter about how we return to health and return to work. Thank you very much. Thank you.